Hi, Gleeho there. I hope everyone's well. I... Sorry that I'm catching this a little bit later than I thought. I thought I'd get this up last night, but I had a really massive toothache, and it's giving me problems. So, there's that. Uh, if I seem a little less cheerful right now, it's because I'm deeply lacking in sleep and in a certain amount of pain. Luckily, I have liquor to help with the, the pain part later and possibly the sleep part. Now, I am going to be talking about uh, the first of the gazetteers in the uh, uh, Gnome World line, also known as Mistara. And uh, I've got some notes. Uh, so, you know, just some, I, some things that I, I, I noted on a, a, a read-through of the first of the gazetteers. Um, and, uh, you know, I just thought I'd talk about some of the differences between it and some of the later products that we may be familiar with. Now, as I addressed in the intro episode, before uh, Mistara and Forgotten Realms, they're pretty close to contemporary, there weren't a whole lot of published settings where the details were pretty much done. Um, I mean, obviously some people tried doing that with uh, Tolkien and occasionally got in trouble for using Tolkien's work without permission, but we'll not get into that. Uh, but, yeah, it's... Uh, most of the time, settings evolved. Uh, there were a series of adventures and such that went into places like Greyhawk. Things involving uh, Blackmoor and what have you uh, went into the sort of organic growth of a setting. Mistara was different in a few ways. Uh, while it did have some proto-forms that uh, existed uh, before it had a fully formed setting, I, they, they talked about it in the expert setting. It showed up in a few adventures. It and Forgotten Realms were the first time TSR really kind of got together and said, you know what, we're just going to do a fully fleshed out world, a game world for people to play in. Now, uh, Mistara was built for the basic D&D, of course. So some of the assumptions of these books is that you don't have to worry about things like um, well, you know, a, a, a difference between race and class. Uh, you're either human with a class or you're a race. There are no elven fighters or dwarven mages or what have you. You're either a dwarf, an elf, a gnome, a halfling, or a human uh, with some class. That's it. You don't have a lot of choices in that regard. And the setting sort of reflects that. Um, uh, the races tend to be homogenous because their classes are archetypical to the race. So elves all have a little bit of magic and a little bit of fighty, but not a lot. Dwarves have a lot more fighty, uh, but no magic. You know, things like that. Um... Halflings all feel a bit uh, roguish. You know, those are aspects to it. Now, to start, uh, the Grand Duchy of Karamikos, or GAZ1, uh, which you can get on D&D Classics, and I'll include a link on uh, the show notes uh, to talk about, what, yeah, or to, to, to take you to where you can get it. Uh, I, I read this originally in print. I've since lost my print copy many, many years ago. Uh, but uh, I, I reread it in PDF format, and the PDF works. Um, uh, a, a quick note on the PDF. Um, some of the maps in the PDF form don't come through as clearly as maybe you would like, so keep that in mind. Now, this is the first gazetteer in the line, uh, and as such, it kind of set the tone for the rest of them. 
Uh, this is a time when there weren't a whole lot of variations on what you could expect in a fantasy role-playing game as far as setting. So they were all somewhat influenced by Western European fantasy tropes. Uh, you know, uh, Tolkien being an, uh, a fine example with some uh, uh, Robert E. Howard and others mixed in there. Now, the uh, the Gazetteer uh, is in keeping with that. Uh, it is probably one of the most Western European of the entire line in its uh, format. The they have some nations later on in the series which are, you know, more Middle Eastern in nature or, or something like that. This one is uh, definitely sort of inspired by uh, European nations. Now, uh, it was written by Aaron Alston, who uh, sadly passed away earlier this year. Uh, he was uh, a fine, fine writer of many, many books. Um, he, uh, uh, he worked in the gaming industry for quite a while, uh, and across the whole spectrum of the gaming industry. He worked on everything from D&D to Heroes. Uh, let's see. He, he wrote several novels. Uh, he wrote, wrote uh, uh, he worked on Champions, the superhero role-playing game. He worked for D on D&D. &D. Um, he worked on Auto Duel. He went, worked on uh, a bunch of things like that. Plus, he also wrote a lot of fiction, like a, an amazing amount of fiction, all things considered, uh, considering how much work other work he had done, honestly. Uh, he worked on some of the X-Men novels, uh, him and Michael Stackpole really kind of owned that space for a while there. Uh, uh, and a lot more of the Star Wars other series like The Fate of the Jedi, Legacy of the Force, New Jedi Order. He worked on all of those. Um, so it, it, he, he was, he was a, uh, you know, a very prolific guy and he had a big impact on the industry. He worked on a lot of things. And... Uh, he sadly passed away back in February, um, which is a shame. Uh, but, you know, he, uh, we get to enjoy his work even after he's gone. And this is one of his early pieces. He, he, uh, he helped write this. Um, he, he, he was the primary writer. I think they had some editing teams helping out with the development side, but he did the, uh, the bulk of the writing. Now, uh, it uh, it starts out with a brief breakdown of the history. Uh, now, uh, the brief breakdown of the history brings up the legendary hig uh, figure of Traladar or Traldar. So, uh, Traldar or Traladar uh, is. Uh, has a very Slavic, very Russian feel to it, uh, and this legendary he healer, uh, healer, uh, ruler in their history, King Havlov, uh, was apparently uh, approached by immortals, which you could read as pretty much being gods, uh, who gave him knowledge he needed to help uh, fight a war against beast men. Uh, which uh, I, I read as being, you know, some of the more beastly non-human races. And he, you know, he and his wife Petra uh, sort of founded a, a golden age of Traladar, and, you know, this golden kingdom. And, and they even say, you know, if the kingdom ever needs, is to rise again, he would have to come back. Because he's that awesome. Uh, and this was a long time ago. Thousands of years ago. And then it went into a dark age. After the fall of that uh, kingdom. Uh, where it was constantly beset by various non-human bad guys. Orcs. Uh, gnolls. Things like that. 
And then, uh, uh, relatively recently, it gets invaded by a nation called Thyatis. Now, Thyatis is their analogy to Rome, the Roman Empire. And Thyatis uh, it invades it after it begins to sort of recover from its long, dark period. They decide, you know what, we need that place under control, under our control, but rather than somebody else's. And they uh, they invaded, and they sort of fumbled around with what to do with the place for a good 30 years or so. And then came Duke Stefan Carmikos III. Uh, he was a young and powerful nobleman in Thyatis, and he made a deal with the emperor. He would trade off all his ancestral lands in Thyatis if he could get... Uh, what became the Grand Duchy of Karmikos, and a certain set, a set of uh, autonomous rules, so that you know basically he gets to run the kingdom however he wants. Uh, you know, as long as he pays a little bit to uh, Thyatis and he traded off some things, uh, and you know maintains good relationships with Thyatis. Uh, in doing this, he sort of shows up, he brings a bunch of Thyatian nobles, and they begin turning the nation into a more Thyatian type nation, a more Roman style nation. And a lot of the inner conflict built into the setting is this conflict between the natives and the uh, uh, Thyatis nobles. Carmikos himself is not actually all that bad a guy. He's a good ruler. He cares about the people under his rule. He just thinks that the Thyatis way of doing things is, you know, more efficient, better, and therefore he, he, he encourages it. But he doesn't, he, he's, for lack of a better description, he's not a dick about it. Members of his family are, and there are plenty of nobles who are, and a lot of the Thyatis uh, settlers show up and just take the land from people. So they're there's a lot of bad that comes with him, but he himself is not actually all that bad a dude. Um, so there, there's a lot of conflict built into that. Um, then, you know, and that's the rough overview, right? Um, the rough overview of the history is, is, you know, first section, this is sort of an intro to here's the world that you live in, here's a few of the places that people live, uh, talks about different uh, attitudes of the people that live there. It also in introduces some interesting sort of callbacks to an old way of doing things, and they've recently s started going back that way with 5th edition, which was adding a, a, a chart to roll for what your background was. You know, if you were from a penniless family or a royal family, and, and you know, include some definitions of what that meant and what your ethnic heritage was. If you were human, you know, like were you more of the Trilodara line or were you more of the Thyatis line? Uh, you know, do those, what are those things going back and forth? Um, and you got charts for rolling this. You also had some charts for the different non human races regarding backgrounds, you know, non-human nobility and what have you. Uh, so it's it's it, it, it's a, a, an older way of doing things. Do, rolling on charts was big in early D&D. They moved away from that in late second edition and into uh, third and, and, and definitely fourth edition, but they've started to swing back that way with fifth edition. Now, uh, after that, they include a section on skills, Skills didn't actually have a thing in D and D yet. They were sort of in D and D. There was the non-weapon proficiencies, and there was some proto forms of skills. This was a little bit more developed rule set of skills. It wasn't a final form of what skills would become in D and D, but you can see the sort of evolution of where they were going there, and that uh, was uh, detailed in there. Then they get into more detailed information about the setting. Uh, uh, things like a much more detailed history comes after that. Uh, much more, uh, including a, a, a timeline. Uh, there is a brief section about different cr crime families. 
Uh, and in fact, they actually uh, have two different sections, which I think is actually poor design on their part. I think they probably could have just sort of combined those and left that be. But, you know, concerning thieves' guilds and, and crime in the, the nation, um, there's a write-up about what social class means uh, and, 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 and politics. Now, the, the, the politics section talks about the different factions moving around in Karamikos, but also gives a, an example of how that politics plays out. Uh, which was handy. I think that the, the example is a good, good idea. Although it uh, it could have been better presented, but it, it's there. Um, you know, they talk about social class and rank and what that means. And this is very much the Western European model of, and the f sort of fictionalized Western European model of, you know, what nobles have obligations and uh, commoners and what they can do and what they can't do and what they you know, is going on there. Some of it is more of a fictionalized version of what Europe was, because European class and uh, social stratas in the Middle Ages is a lot more complex than most people realize. But, you know, simplicity sometimes uh, uh, trumps out. People like to have things simple. So... Uh, after that, there's a, uh, an interesting section on uh, religious orders, the clergy in, in uh, the Grand Duchy of Garmikos. The reason it's interesting is it doesn't actually talk about specific gods. What it does is it's got several churches that sort of reflect religious traditions, that uh, reflect certain moral structures, and they are very much related to the two major human factions as far as human cultural factions, the Trelidar and the Thyatis, and, and what their different religious takes are, but it's much more philosophical and way of living, and that I didn't see anything about a specific god that these two different groups uh, worshipped. So that's odd. Later on, and certainly in some of the other uh, settings, uh, you end up with lots of, uh, you know, the different gods and the religions, how they break down, break down based on the gods that they're involved with. This one didn't. Um, and I had forgotten that, honestly, until I had reread it here. Uh, I think it may have something to do with the fact that later on in the series of uh, rules, they included rules for immortals, where you are playing gods. Uh, but I don't know for sure. Uh, you know, certainly uh, Forgotten Realms went the other direction, where, you know, there were the churches of the different religions. So I can't say why it was like that. But it's an interesting bit of uh, difference from what we would expect from a modern setting example. Most of the setting examples have... You know, these these are the, the, the clerics of these gods, and this is what they do, and this is how they live. This was, this is the different kinds of clerics, but, yeah, we're not going to tell you what gods they worship, which was odd. Uh, maybe they assume that it's just a sing, single overall god, and they're just both worshiping the same thing. Anyway, um... There's a bunch of detail after that about uh, the little things that make a, a, a setting more feel breathed in and lived in. Uh, maybe too much detail, honestly. Uh, I don't know that they needed multiple pages about the military strength and structures. Uh, they, they had a bit on, on how people dress, which is nice, actually, but it would have been good if they had had more uh, pictures in that section, honestly. Um, art is a good way of making those conversations, and they weren't doing it there. Again, this is something we do different now, but this is a relatively new idea, so maybe they hadn't quite glommed onto that. There was a whole section on heraldry, with a whole page breakdown of, like, here are some major uh, her heraldic symbols that you need to know about, 
uh, you know, a bunch of other little things like that. They also do some time talking about the economy of the setting, uh, how the land varies, and even some write-ups of the different cities. The rest of the book after that point, because all of that information is PC accessible. These, this is stuff that PCs could know, that they'll sort of help breathe life into the land that they're going to be playing in. After that section is all DM information. How to use the provided maps, character stats for major NPCs, adventure ideas, how to run campaigns, uh, what uh, monsters are found there, uh, you know, as from the, the other books that, that had come out with monsters, and including some stats on some new monsters. Um, so, I mean, the, the, the rest of it is much more GM-focused than player-focused, and they've got some advice. Uh, and it's good. It's maybe not the best, but it's good. Uh, I do find it interesting that a, they reserved a lot of their interior artwork, not all of it, but a lot of it, to the GM section. I would have put that in the player section. I, I would have thought that would have been the natural choice. But no, a lot of their interior artwork is in the GM section. So the GM gets to know what these different characters might look like and, and what have you, but the players don't, which is kind of a, a strange choice. Um, now, a note on the maps. Uh, specifically, there are the big scale maps, the ones that are of the land and the nation in general, are hex grid, which was much more popular back then. Um, hex grid maps kind of fell out of vogue in D&D &D, uh, late 90s, the third edition on uh, era, because, you know, they had included rules for doing combats where basically it was, it was a much more box structure and not hex structure. So, uh, you know, they weren't as popular for a while there, but it, way back when, hex grid was how you did it. Uh, and the large scale maps uh, actually have different terrain types in each different hex. The hex only ha usually has only one terrain type. So this would make it good for any kind of realm management system that you wanted to build off of it. And it would be good for uh, the uh, sort of sandboxy elements. I go to this hex. And this is the adventure that you have in this hex. And, you know, the GM marks it off and, you know, this is what we did there. And move on to the next hex and the next and the next. So it's it's interesting. Uh, I like it. Um, overall, we've gotten better at a lot of this stuff as far as, you know, game publishing, you know, what needs to be there as opposed to what doesn't need to be there. Um, some of the stat blocks uh, for the NPCs were a bit extraneous. Why do you need that? Um, and some of the write-ups, uh, there are a lot of NPC write-ups in the GM section and you kind of find yourself going, why do you have so much? Why do you need quite so much material there? Uh, so those are things that, you know, sort of, I think would be done differently now. Like I said, the artwork being all in the GM section, as opposed to the player section, didn't make a lot of sense to me. Um, and uh, there are, you know, some other minor things. Having a lot of detail to breathe life into a setting is always always good, but um, it's weird to sort of pick and choose where you're providing that detail. Um, and I think part of the reason why the military structure and such got quite so much time and quite so much play has to do with the wargaming origins of D&D &D in general. Um, but, because there's a lot of, you know, here's how people dress, and this is what the economy is, but it doesn't give a solid feel of maybe 
what the day-to-day -day life for most folks is. Um, they still, it, for the time, it was amazing. And it, it, it still has a lot of interesting things. This is very much a, a setting uh, you could run a campaign in Karmikos, uh, Karamikos, for, you know, years and years, and not run out of stuff to do, because it's a, it is a perfectly acceptable, perfectly valid, generic setting, uh, and I think uh, that is its strength. It is not the, uh, how to put this, it's a, uh, it's kind of bland, I guess. It doesn't have a lot of, uh, this is going to catch you and draw you in. At least not the first gadget here, anyway. It, it doesn't have a lot of, you know, catch you. But it is a really solid, you want to get up and running with a standard run-of-the-mill classic D&D game. This setting works. It is, has all the moving parts that you need to have the fighter, the mage, the cleric, the thief, uh, the elf, what have you, uh, running around and doing stuff. Uh, so it, it, it does its job. It is not the most interesting of the ones, but it's a good primer for the rest of the setting as far as this is where you get your feet wet, right? This is what you can expect. Uh, the later gazetteers actually add more and more stuff. Uh, some of them add more rules, some of them add more material beyond just this is how the setting is, uh, th this is the, you know, how the, the history of this particular nation and how the names are set or anything like that, but actually have more detail. So, anyways, this is my uh, review of the first of the Gazetteers. I plan on doing all of them, uh, though I... We'll maybe not do them all in quick succession uh, because that would be kind of crazy and I like to have multiple things to talk about. But I will be doing at least one a month, uh, maybe two, depending on the month. Uh, I hope you liked it. Um, be sure to go check it out because, honestly, they are not expensive. They are super cheap. They're easy to find. They're... Uh, because... DD Classics has got them out there. They're not expensive. They're a good read. Uh, and it might give you ideas for how to run maybe a 5th edition game. I could totally see running a 5th edition game in Mistara. I could. Uh, part of me would actually kind of like to run it as a basic DD, you know, classic DD rule cyclopedia, the whole nine yards. But either, either way, uh, it's a it's a good solid D and D sort of generic setting. It's right up there with Forgotten Realms and Greyhawk and what have you. Actually, I would put it above Greyhawk. And I know some of my classic uh, uh, D and D buddies might uh, scoff at me there, but I I actually like it better than Greyhawk overall. The setting overall. This particular gadget here is a good intro to it. You should check it out. Anyway, subscribe, like, share with all the people. And uh, try not to set anything on fire between now and then. Okay? All right. I'll talk to you later. Bye.